Very little had moved here, which was astonishing considering the force of the explosion that ripped off the stern of the ship and the consequent sinking. Within its holds, this cargo is a true underwater Second World War museum. We came across some aeroplane wings. At a guess, they were intended for the Spitfire fighters operating in North Africa. We ascended into a hold above. Here were more motorbikes, lots of them, and the water was cleaner. If it weren't for the soldier fishers swimming around, this scene could have been in a warehouse on dry land. These were large spaces, crammed with cargo. Here again was a view of the massive effort and the consumption of machinery and equipment that went into the war. Around every turn was something new. For example, this was an armored vehicle that was built on top of a Rolls-Royce chassis. But even three centimeter thick steel plates couldn't hold out against 60 years of seawater. We were now getting quite deep into the ship, to an area not commonly visited. The water was very clean and there was clarity and depth that left a sharp definition on everything. We came to the remains of a stairway. There was now a crinoid growing on it. There were also bubbles coming up through the floor from air trapped below, evidence of the large number of divers who explore this wreck.
Eventually, we were out of the hold and over the deck. Here were hoists, winches and other machines typical of cargo vessels. In another hold, we came across rifles scattered all over the floor. These were Lee Enfields, crates of them destined for the troops in North Africa. I found it was much better to film without my lights whenever there was enough ambient light. This greatly reduced backscatter. As we ascended from the loading bay, the sea turtle swam by, probably the same one from earlier on. Carl had said he would show us some of the other sections of the ship away from the big cargo holds. So we entered a door and worked our way in. Here were rolls of electric cables scattered all over. Emerging into the open, there was a railway tank wagon on the deck, part of the two sets of steam engines travelling as deck cargo. We swam to the port side and made our way to the bow section. Apart from some minor corrosion, this part of the ship was perfectly intact. Also, it is mainly to this section that the diving yachts moor themselves. There were mooring lines going up from various places on the bow. Wherever there was an opening in the deck, trapped air from the divers and the holds below escaped in streams of silver bubbles. When Thistlegorm was attacked, only one of its two anchors had been deployed along with 250 meters of chain. I assumed it was this one. I was impressed by the size of the links and all the associated machinery. Swimming back along the starboard side, we came across another railway tank wagon perilously close to the edge. As I swam past alongside it, I spotted the yellow bar angelfish. My lights were off because we were still going to penetrate another section of the wreck and I wanted to save the battery power, but I decided to go back and film it. So I turned the lights on and got some material of it. Further along the deck I came across what I thought was a small aeroplane turned upside down. But Carl later explained that this was in fact a minesweeper. It was dragged through the water and designed to cut off the lines anchoring sea mines. 
We made our way to the captain's cabin, and on the way we passed a stairway, showing the forces at work during the attack on the ship and the sinking. In the captain's cabin, the washing basin and bath were still there. But Jacques Cousteau, during his first exploration of the ship in 1955, had removed the captain's safe from here, along with the ship's bell and one motorcycle. Carl took us to another cabin and let me go in first. This was an equally interesting place, probably used by the officers on board. We were nearing the end of our dive and started swimming back to the mooring line that would lead us to our boat. There were a few moments to contemplate what we had seen. The fact that so much of the cargo has remained undisturbed is a tribute to the divers who visit this wreck. Although it is true that some things have been removed by self-seeking individuals, almost all who dive here consider it a real privilege to visit the ship and its amazing contents, and they show proper respect for it. An hour later, I was watching another boat arrive, full of divers. Officially, the British government has banned all diving on wrecks that are declared war graves, including the Thistlegorm. But that ban has never been enforced. Watching boats come and go here, one can only wonder how much longer they will look the other way.